2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to start by telling you a story uh, about myself. About two years ago, I had my identity stolen, and um, it was uh, really pretty freaky. In a matter of hours, someone took out six credit cards in my name and spent $60,000, okay, just like in, in hours. Uh, and I would discover subsequently that they continued, he, she, I don't know who it was, but continued to take out more credit cards in my name, racking up more debt. But sometime during that day, um, it was toward the afternoon, I got a call from a credit card company and they said, uh, are you Brian Fisher? I said, yeah, is your phone number 97977? You're like, yeah, that's me, right? Uh, were you just at the Galleria in Houston and did you spend $10,000 on leather purses? I'm like, I mean, literally I was sitting right there, right in my office. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've, I've was, I, was, I didn't know at that point that they'd already spent like 50,000 more, right? I didn't know that. And I didn't know there were tens of thousands more. That wouldn't be until later I'm getting these cards, these, these credit card bills in the mail. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, no, you gotta be kidding me. I didn't even know you could spend $10,000 on purses, right? I mean, what's a purse cost these days, by the way? I didn't ask. Is that like $100 is a nice one? No, no higher. 1,000, I mean, 10... Is that like 10 purses, 10 nice purses? I don't, I don't even know, right? But I'm just thinking, I have, I have no care, concern, issue. I, have, I don't want purses, right? What am I gonna do with $10,000 worth? Somebody's in my name is going out and buying things that I don't want or need or care about at all, right? Which really bugs me on multiple levels, but one of them is, like, I try to be real intentional in how I spend my money. Now, I'm not always. Sometimes I just spend my money and I realize afterwards when I want to spend it on something else that it's not there. And I go, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Right? But, I, but I want to be intentional. I, want to, I really genuinely, as we've talked about in the series, I, I want to invest in eternity because that, that matters to me. And then when I don't, act intentionally, it bothers me myself, let alone somebody else going out and spending money in my name. But I want to be an intentional person. I want to invest in eternity. And hopefully you do as well. Remember, as we started this series, this is the question that we were asking and answering. Why should we become generous and joyful givers? Why should we uh, invest our money intentionally for the Lord? And I gave you guys four reasons First, because giving is an act of worship and God is worthy of our worship. In fact, we saw is that Paul borrows the imagery from Old Testament sacrifices of the burnt offering going up, the smoke and the incense going up before the Lord. And he says, one of the really important ways that you worship God is with your wealth. Sure, certainly as you sing and you, you, you praise and you pray and you share your faith, those are all acts of worship, but with your money because it's so directly tied to your heart. So God doesn't need your money, but what he wants is your heart. And so when you release these resources as an act of worship, it's not so much the quantity, but where your heart is. Second, because giving is an investment in eternity. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. You can't take any of it with you. It all stays here, but you can invest in the lives of people finding and following Jesus so that when you enter into eternity, you all celebrate together that you lived wisely and you invested in what matters, which is people. Third, because God made us rich. He made us rich spiritually. He has made us rich materially. And because we are rich, we have an opportunity and an obligation to share with others around us. And then fourth, because giving crushes our idols, right? We don't often worship money itself, but we do worship other things. And with our money, we can chase those things. And when we begin to release our grip and we give it away, God crushes those false gods that have gripped our heart, right? So hopefully now you're, you're super motivated. You say, I, I know not just that greediness is bad, but generosity is good. And I wanna be a generous person. The question then is how? And that's what I wanna look at this morning, how? Practically speaking, how do we become excellent at giving? And I wanna give you four biblical principles. The first is this, give consistently, give consistently. First Corinthians Chapter 16, verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers and he said this, with regard to the collection for the saints, please follow the directions that I gave to the churches of Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside some income and save it to the extent that God has blessed you, right? Set it aside, save it so that you can share it 
with others. Do it regularly, do it consistently. Let this become a habit in your lives. Now, last time you went to the dentist, what was the first question that you were asked? Do you remember? It's the same, thank you, right? Same question that they ask every time. Uh, Did you floss, right? Or have you been flossing? And the answer is, no, the answer is yes this morning, right? (laughs) Because I knew I was coming in, and so, yeah, that's why I'm all bloody, right? Because, yeah, I've I've flossed once in the last 18 months because I forgot my other appointments. Have you flossed? Yes. Yes, I have. (laughs) I have flossed one time. Uh, I actually, you know, a few years ago, I actually became a regular, consistent flosser. That's a, like the daughter of a dentist, right? Just, yay, way to go. One, one other person. Uh, here's the, I read an article about the value of flossing, right? Because I, I need to know the value of something. So in this article, it wasn't just about flossing, but about all these other little habits you can pick up on a daily basis that add value to your life. And it may be longevity or it may be quality of life, but these things add value. And it said flossing, right? You, you keep more of your teeth. You, right, you, you don't have cavities, and cavities hurt, and they're expensive. And, right, and that, you know, that, that motivation just really struck me. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. And so I began to floss. I didn't do it every day at first, but I just kind of slowly built this little habit into my life. And that's, that's how good habits work. Right? You can't change everything all at once, and really, you can't change your whole life in one day of little habits. But over a lifetime, if you do some of these little things, it can really change the course of your life in some respects, right? It's true of exercise. If you don't exercise, you should. But if you don't exercise, don't run a marathon tomorrow because you'll die, right? I mean, you can't go to zero to 26.2. It'll kill you. So you say, okay, I can't do that, but let me just break a sweat three times this week and not just because I ran to the fridge, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change just a little bit, or I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to go from five Kit Kats a day to four, or two, right? Just kidding. Add an apple, right? Do something constructive. A little change. A few years ago, I met with a financial planner friend of mine, and I said, how much do I need to save and put aside every month in order to pay for my college, my kid's college education? He said, well, with the rate of inflation for higher education, uh, you can't. <laughs> so don't really worry about it. Just start. Or just start. And what's true there in the, the physical world, whether it's what you eat or your exercise or how you save money for a goal like kids' education, it's the same. It's the same principle. Just start and take little, consistent steps. You won't change the world one day, but slowly, surely, it will change the course of your life. It's true in the spiritual world as well. If you say, you know, I, I really need to read the Bible, so I'll do it tomorrow. But tomorrow I'll read the whole Bible. <laughs> no, don't do that. Just say 10 minutes. Uh, I, I need self-discipline. I'm going to introduce the discipline of fasting. Jesus fasted 40 days, therefore I will fast. For, no, then you're going to die again, right? You're going you, you're to die from the marathon. You're going to die from fasting 40 days. Just say, let me skip one meal and spend the time in prayer. Just take a little step. The same is true in giving. Giving is a, it's a spiritual Discipline through which God has access to our hearts to change the patterns of our lives, okay? Little by little. So Paul says, the first of every week, set something aside as God has prospered. All right, students, I want to encourage you. You may say to yourself, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have an enormous amount to give right now, right? I'm, I'm paying tuition, I'm working a part-time job, I've got to pay rent and food. That's fine, I understand that. Just start the habit. Because if you start the habit now, it's going to be easier to continue it into the rest of your life. And then when you get the job, the habit's already started. Because if you don't have the habit already, as that money begins to come in, you're going to say, well, then I'll start then. But it it actually, it'll get a grip on your life quickly if you haven't begun that little habit. So just start, right? So you start and then you stretch. You start the habit, and then God stretches. And as your faith grows, your generosity grows. And as your generosity grows, your faith grows. And you have built this life-transforming habit for the rest of your life. Now, second, give sacrificially. Give sacrificially. If you have not turned to 2 Corinthians 8, and please turn there now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Paul writing to the Corinthian believers, again he says, Now, brethren, 
we wish to make known to you the grace of God. And just stop for a second. If you've got a pen, circle the word grace because in the next two chapters, Paul is going to talk about generosity. And the entire conversation about generosity, he's going to frame in terms of grace. So I'm going to come back to that concept in just a moment. Right? He says, We wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of both joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and even beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor or the grace, literally, of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. You see what he says? All that we are and all that we have, the Macedonians wanted to give to the Lord. In fact, even though they were very poor people, they begged, they said, Paul, please let us help out. And Paul may have gone, no, 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 you know, you, you guys are poor. It's, no, please let us participate in God's redemptive work in the world. Let us share with other churches that may even be more needy than we are. Let us give and give. We were longing to give. Can you imagine that attitude? You know, when we built this particular building, it was 91 or 92, uh, the largest gift that came for this facility was actually from a college student. Right? And everybody was used to saying, well, college kids can't give anything. They don't have in, that much income. Well, the largest single gift actually came from a college student. A college student came to the office of one of our elders, and he said, I want to give this amount. And it was an, an enormous amount. And literally, our, our elder said, no, you need, you're, you're early in your life and your career, and you're going to want to get married and you have kids. You need to, you need to hold on to that. And, and he begged. He said, don't, don't take this opportunity away from me. Just this last week, we had a student come in and she gave an incredible sum of money for her, where she is in life. And again, one of our staff members said, no, you, you need to hold on to that. You've got rent and food. You have some, some needs. And she said, please, I told God I wanted to give this. Don't take it away from me. And she begged. Can you imagine begging for participation what motivates me to want to become that kind of giver, and I'm not always, but I want to, and what motivates me is when I think about the sacrifice of Jesus. But I, I can't pay Jesus back. Remember, eternal life and the removal of the debt of our sins is an absolutely free gift. We don't earn it in any respect. We can't pay God back. But when I think about the depth of the sacrifice of Jesus for me, it just awakens a longing to be generous and sacrificial within me as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul ends this entire two chapters on generosity with these words. He says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And what's he referring to? Jesus. Right? You can't outgive God. God gave what was most valuable, not just to him, but in the universe. He gave the gift of his son, Jesus. He sacrificed more than any of us have ever sacrificed. And what that does for me is it stirs up in my heart a longing, a desire. I want to be sacrificial. The other thing that really stirs me up is when I think about the value of eternity. When I compare to eternity to today, it stirs my heart. And I think, you know, I want to make those sacrifices now so that I can enjoy what lasts so much longer. And I will tell you, I have known so many college guys who have lived on ramen for a year just so they can save enough money to buy a ring. And not their Aggie ring, but an engagement ring, right? And not, not the expensive kind of ramen that costs a dollar, like the really cheap stuff that's like 10 cents and there's a bag of powder in there. You have no idea what's in that, right? But for a year, somehow they survive on ramen and mystery powder. And, and they, they, they go, it's not a sacrifice at all. Why? Because they value some, something so much more and it, it, it's, that, it's that girl. So they sacrifice because they value something even more highly. Listen to these words by David Livingstone. Uh, he was a missionary from England that went to Africa and spent almost all of his life in Africa. 
He said, people talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and they may cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us and for us. I never made a sacrifice. That's powerful, isn't it? As Chip Ingram wrote in his book, On excellence in giving, he said, to be smart, spend carefully. To be wise, save regularly. To be genius, spend, uh, uh, give extravagantly. Give sacrificially. It's just genius in light of the glory that is to be revealed to us. And in fact, we know that all worship at some level involves sacrifice, right? You made a sacrifice this morning to be here. You chose, I'm not going to keep sleeping, or I'm not just going to go to the park and play frisbee golf. I'm not going to work on my homework. I'm going to say no to something else so I can say yes to being in the presence of the Lord and with God's people. That's a sacrifice. Every time you worship, genuinely worship, there's a sacrifice. And the same is true with giving. Do you remember when David wanted to, to purchase the threshing floor of Arauna? He wanted to make a sacrifice. And Arauna said, hey, you're the king of Israel. King, just let me give it to you. And these were David's words. He said, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. David says, I want to sacrifice because I love God. First principle, give consistently. Second principle, give sacrificially. Third, give freely or give willingly. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. That word for cheerful is uh, literally, it's the word from which we derive hilarious. Right? It's a Greek word, hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver, right? He's not laughing all the way to the bank. He's laughing all the way from the bank, right? He's, he's enjoying. He's just, oh, I love doing this. Not grudgingly, I got to give her under compulsion. Somebody's forcing, but joyfully, cheerfully. That's the kind of giving that God loves. Now, I want to remind you that uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day. I see a few people go, oh, you're welcome. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. And hopefully you will remember again in a week. And you're going to call your mom and say, mom, happy Mother's Day. And she'll say, oh, honey, thank you so much. I really appreciate your calling. And you're going to say, you know, really, it's no big deal. Don't, don't thank me. It's, it's my duty. <laughs> Hallmark makes me. And, you know, I, I'm just, I, I've done my duty. I actually got you a card, too. It's going to be a little bit late. But it's a very expensive card. I spent $5 on this. So I hope you like it and don't throw it out, right? Because it expresses someone else's sentiments uh, about moms to you. Uh, <laughs> And now you know how I feel about Hallmark cards. <laughs> Man, that's crash and burn, right? Mom, your mom's going to say, click. I brought you into this world, right? I stayed up nights with you when you're crying and fussing and you had colic. You were a miserable child who tortured me, but I loved you anyway. And this is the best that you can do. No. Not just duty, not just obligation, but Joy. Joyful sacrifice. Sounds like a a contradiction, doesn't it? You know, the Bible is actually filled with paradoxes. Jesus loved paradoxes. He who saves his life, right? Keeps it to himself, he'll lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake, he'll keep it. He who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Try telling that to a two-year-old. Right? Whose favorite word is mine, mine, mine. No, really, you're going to be happier if you share your toys with your brother or sister. No, mine, right? You, even though a two-year-old doesn't believe it, it's still true. It's a paradox. It is more blessed to give than receive. So how do we, how do we figure that one out? How do we become genuinely joyful givers? No, just one chapter back, 8, verse 6, Paul writes, Accordingly, we urge Titus, that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Remember I had you circle the word grace 
or favor. He's, what he's talking about is grace. So what's the act of grace? The act of grace is this, that God has given us an indescribable gift, freely. It's a gift. It's, it's unmerited, undeserved favor. That's grace. Having received grace, we can turn around and give grace. It's an act of grace when we share with others. Why? Because the creator of the universe has said to us, I want to participate with you. I want you to share with me in redeeming people from sin and slavery and shame and guilt and death. Wow, what an incredible privilege. That's grace. The act of grace then becomes us getting to participate with the creator of the universe in his redemptive plan for all tribes and tongues and people and nation. When I realize that, it fills me with joy. I say, yes, my life has meaning, my life has purpose, and it excites me, it thrills me. Remember, uh, this has happened to the people of God many times. Back in 1 Chronicles 29, I want to remind you of this story briefly. David wants to build a temple, but God says no. Solomon will. So David said, but there must be. I want, Lord, I want you to be worshiped. So I'm going to gather resources so that Solomon is ready. And David makes an offering for the temple to be built. And then all the leaders of Israel, they make an offering. It's an enormous offering. Then all the people get excited and they make an offering. And it says, every time David offered willingly, the leaders offered willingly, the people offered willingly, willingly, willingly. It was, it was freely. It wasn't coercion. It was just the joy of their hearts. And the result was that they had a party and they celebrated for a week. They said, we have to celebrate what God is doing in us and through us. And they celebrated. Same thing happened in Hezekiah's day. The, the, the priests rediscovered the word of God and they brought it out and they're reading it. And all the people are, they're sorrowful over their sins, but they're rejoicing that they've discovered the word and there's a revival. And they say, let's repair the temple that's broken down because they've been living under Manasseh, who was an evil, horrible, idolatrous king. And the temple's fallen into disrepair and there are idols everywhere. And they say, let's clean house. And they wipe it all out. And they say, now let's repair the temple and bring in offerings. And they give and they give and they give. And pretty soon Hezekiah has to say, whoa, please stop. There's just too much. Same happened when Israel was redeemed out of sin and slavery and death in Egypt. And Moses says, here's the tabernacle plan that God has laid in front of us. And they begin to give willingly, freely, joyfully, so much so that Moses has to say, stop, you must stop. There's just too much. Why? Because God has transformed their hearts. And they're not giving because they have to. They're giving because they want to. And that's, that's an offering that pleases the Lord. Now, you may have noticed that in the last uh, five weeks, I haven't yet said the word tithe. Okay? And, and that's on purpose because I never teach that people should tithe. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you something right now. Please, I'm going to give my opinion on this matter, and I, please don't come up and argue with me. You can argue with me about lots of different stuff, and I hope that you know, you're like the Bereans, and every time you open the Word and you hear me preach, that you compare what I say to the Word. Do that all the time. But on this in particular, just don't come up and argue with me, because I'm going to tell you right now, I could be wrong, and if you win the argument, great, but I'm just going to give you my opinion on tithing, right? Okay, no arguments? We can just agree to disagree as I give my opinion since I have the microphone. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> After the resurrection of Jesus, tithing is never mentioned in the Bible. Right? So after death, burial, and resurrection, the, the epistles never mention tithing. They don't commend tithing. They don't condemn tithing. They just don't say anything about it at all. It was an Old Testament practice under the law and even predated the law itself. And the idea was this, a tithe means a tenth. So the Israelites were required to bring a tenth before they spent anything on themselves. Right? The first tenth would go to the Lord. That was the tithe. And it reminded them that God is the source of all things. However, there were other offerings that they gave. It wasn't just 10% and you're done. In fact, they would give uh, free will offerings. Most of the offerings that Israelites brought were not as a payment for sin, but in fact were just for worship. There were consistent offerings for the poor. Every seven years, all debts were erased. If you had land, you left a strip all the way around your property so that the poor could come and they could gather. In other words, it was probably, uh, being an economist, I actually wrote a paper in seminary on the economic system of ancient Israel, just for fun. And um, it's probably more like 
40 percent. I mean, it was basically what it was is just this culture of generosity. It's just a culture of generosity. And so since tithing is not reiterated for the church, I, I say, let's focus on what is spoken to the church, and, and that's this, generosity. Right? Give freely, give joyfully, give generously, give sacrificially. This is what God calls us to. And the problem with saying it's just a tenth is that we can descend quickly into legalism. Right? I owe a tenth to the Lord and then I'm done. But is that pre-tax income or can I, can I actually tithe after tax? Or what if somebody bought my lunch today and it was about $8? Do I owe God 80 cents to remain in his favor? I, you know, and then we can look at other people and say, man, with the size of house that person has, surely they're not giving their tenth. Well, you know, they may be given 50% because they make so much money or 90%. You don't know. But it, it, it can cause us to descend into legalism and we miss the point. God loves a cheerful giver. The, the, the giving that pleases the heart of God is when we do it joyfully, freely, generously. Right? So that's what I think the church should focus on. Fourth, give wisely. Right? Give wisely. Luke chapter 16, we looked at this parable a couple weeks ago. And at the conclusion, Jesus says this. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Remember in the parable, there's an unjust or unrighteous steward. He's squandering his master's resources. So the master says, you're out. But before all of the debtors find out, he goes around to each of them. He says, oh, you owe my master 100 measures of wheat. Make it 50. He begins to reduce all their debts, right? That's just shrewd. And the, the master says, wow, that was pretty smart. He doesn't commend his unrighteousness, but wow, Jesus says, that's shrewd. Or in one of my translations, it says sensible. And literally the idea is this, think about it. Right? Think about it. Be intentional. Men and women, you have limited time on earth and you have limited financial resources. Therefore, invest wisely. If you were going to invest some money in a stock, you wouldn't rent a monkey, blindfold him, and have him throw darts at a stock page, right? You know, no, no. I'm going to research, I'm going to be wise, I'm going to be intentional, I'm going to be shrewd. The same is true with our eternal investments. So let me give you two biblical priorities as we give. The first is this, give to help people who are in need. Give to help people who are in need. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Old Testament, New Testament, one of the marks of a person who's mature or a city that's godly or a culture that is godly is what do they do for the people who can't care for themselves? The orphan, the widow, the one who's stranded, not the person who can work and should work. Paul says, if any man will not work, neither let him eat. But those who genuinely cannot care for themselves. Those who are a lower station in life, those who are marginalized in our culture, do we care for them? That is a biblical mandate, Old Testament and New Testament. Second, give to make disciples. Acts chapter one, verse eight, reads like this. The Lord is speaking, Jesus is speaking. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. That's, that's a restatement of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Church, why are we here? To love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And having been transformed by that love, to make disciples of all nations. And someday we'll be in the presence of the Lord and we will love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength much better than we do today. We will be worshiping and singing, but we won't be making disciples. We won't be helping people find and follow Jesus because they will all have been found by Jesus and they will all be following Jesus completely. So right now, why is the church ultimately on earth still? What is our purpose? What is our mission? It's the Great Commission. For every local church, the mission is the same. Make disciples of all nations. So students in particular, during your time here at Grace, and then as you leave, I hope you catch this vision that just inflames your heart to make disciples of all nations. I hope you, you realize you don't have to know everything to have something to invest in someone else's life. If you know the gospel, 
Share the gospel. If you know how to pray, teach them how to pray. If you know how to read the word, teach them how to read the word. If you know how, how to help somebody just find Jesus or just begin to follow Jesus, that's, that's your mission. That's your calling. So as you leave here, go out and find a church that is into disciple making. And then invest your time and your talents and your skills and your money in a church that wants to make disciples of all nations. And if you can't find one, then plant one. Or help revitalize one as you model discipleship in your life in that church. But don't miss the point. No matter what your career is, your calling in life is to make disciples of all nations. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Just this last week, I had lunch with a friend of mine. We've known each other since college. And uh, he became a, a Christian freshman year in college. And then he got involved in a group of guys. There were about six of them. And they made a commitment to one another. They said, all of us will be goers or senders. And we're going to make that commitment. We will stay connected the rest of our lives, and we will either go or send. Two of those guys were goers. They went as missionaries. The rest of them made money and sent. And then in their local communities, they shared their faith, and they made disciples. And they continued to hold one another accountable to live for the cause of Jesus Christ their entire lives. Students, don't miss that here. Go find it when you move to a new city. Adults, don't miss the purpose and the mission of the church. That's really what this whole process of Every Knee is about. It's about refining and and, and restating the mission of the church. Every knee will someday bow to Jesus Christ. Among every tribe and tongue and people and nation, So that's what we want to be about. Every day, every neighbor, every nation. Does that sound familiar? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what we're about is thinking through in the next two years, how can we just do that better? How can we do that more effectively? This church has been around for 53 years, and God has just done phenomenal things through this church. All the credit goes to him, right? Ten families started this church. Ten families. Now, on any given weekend, there are probably 5,000 people that worship at the three campuses, a Mandarin fellowship that's in the process of merging with another Chinese church. 5,000 people. Over half of our congregation is students. Students, we get to pour into you a little bit, and then you go out to be disciple makers among the nations. What an incredible opportunity. 160 of our students have been trained through our fellows program in ministry skills, and they've gone out to affect the nations. We have 160 missionaries full-time on the field who have participated in planting 1,500 churches, all from Little Bryan College Station, from 10 families who never could have imagined that God would do this. Let's say that all the credit goes to God. And I, and I can just imagine that the Lord is saying, well done. What are you waiting for? It, well done. Excel still more. What will be accomplished in the next 50 years? For for me and Tristy, we have invested our entire married life in this church. And we haven't wanted to leave because we're, we're compelled by the vision of this church. We want to be a part of a church that wants to make disciples of all nations. And probably one of the best things for me about these last uh, several weeks and even months in this process has been hearing people's stories about how God is moving in their hearts. Not amounts, but hearts. And hearing their stories of transformation where they're they're releasing idols and the idols are being crushed. Instead, they're saying, let me give my life to the cause of Christ. And I've gotten to hear a lot of those stories. I wanna share a few with you. Uh, Last Friday night, we captured a few of those on video. So if I can, Uh, have you guys share the video with some of these stories about um, what God's doing in our midst. I think grace is just headed in such an amazing direction. I think that this is such a testament that it starts with humility. It starts with our hearts. 
and that from there, God really can work with that well. well I need to be giving like a little part of this um, that my parents are giving me right now so that when I am making more money and doing it, it's gonna be easier for me um, to give to the Lord. And it's been so cool to see the Lord stretch uh, what I thought was a really large amount into an even larger amount. Um, it's been cool to see the Lord uh, really stretch that in my heart and in the lives uh, of the people around me. And I'm really excited to see what he's gonna continue to do through this. It's interesting for this to happen kind of in the beginning of our time here and to see um, just how we're gonna play a part in the greater church of grace and in the greater body of Christ in College Station. Seeing that we have a goal really just pushes me forward and um, wanting to, in fact, reach every single person in our community. It's not my time, it's not my life, it's not mine to, to choose and to, to take, but it's mine to give. Um, it's not my resources, it's definitely the Lord's. Everything that I have has been a gift from Him, and so it's my duty to give it back. I think thinking through the past couple of years, um, Grace's heart for the world is really has been really inspiring, and um, I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited to see where the fourth plant might be, or and to see how God uses Creekside, and even what God does through the young adult ministry to reach every neighbor. We moved to College Station and, and started to attend um, at Anderson for about six months, and then Southwood was open, and our entire home church moved to Southwood, and we saw how that church uh, filled up and grew over time, and and now how that's turned into Creekside. It's even more exciting to know that our church body has um, a, a vision to reach more people for the gospel, not just here in our community, but also around the world. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things that the Lord has been teaching me um, through this and in general the past few months and weeks um, has been just about giving. Um, over the past few years, I'm in, I'm in college and I've worked a lot, um, but I still wore that mask of the broke college student that doesn't have any money. Um, but the reality is I, I have more than I need. God answered prayers um, that I, I feel like I didn't even deserve. I never even prayed big enough um, for the gifts that I received as a fellow. And so I think it was through witnessing people's generosity that I am now able to say, like, I have to give because people have given in the ministry that God has called me to through Grace Bible Church. And so now I am in a place where um, I, I can't not give. Hey, let me ask you to uh, take out your card real quick. Uh, this uh, card represents uh, two-year commitment, uh, what we feel like God is calling us to do over the next two years. And you don't have to fill out uh, every single box. That last box is just uh, what you expect in the next two years that uh, God may be calling you to give, to participate with what Grace Bible Church is doing. And, and I wanna remind you, this is, it's not a pledge card. Uh, I won't see your cards and the elder won't see, elders won't see individual cards, but it's a way for you to communicate with the leadership of the church. Have, have we dreamed big enough to what God is calling us to do? Uh, part of the way that God speaks to the church, as I said the first week, is through his people. And so, you know, as you fill this out, uh, it may be that through the next couple of years that you have difficult financial times and you can't, you can't fulfill it. That's fine. Or maybe that God blesses you even more and you can get more. That's fine. That's, that's all. This is just to help you think through, how is God stretching me? And that first box on the top, it may be zero. You may have never given to the church before. It may never have occurred to you. Well, I can participate in the Great Commission through what God is doing through my church. Man, if you, or maybe you've never given at all. First time that you ever started that habit, maybe that's this morning. How fantastic is that? And then maybe you have given before and God is calling you to stretch and exercise some faith. Uh, Tristy and I realized as we began, we just laid this thing out on our, on our counter and we just let it sit there over the last four, five weeks. And we talked about it over and over and over again and asked the Lord, what are you calling us to do? And how are you calling us to participate? Uh, I want to remind you, if you're a visitor, we're not expecting you to jump in with us. Uh, if you're a parent and you want to give to where your, your child was fed for the last four years or three years or two years or six years or whatever, hey, that's great. Um, but maybe it just would inspire you to go back and participate with what your home church is doing to make disciples of all nations. So I would encourage you in the next few moments, uh, fill this out. Put it in the envelope. We're going to give you a moment uh, shortly after some, some time for quiet prayer, and then you can come and drop it off up front, front. But after you fill this out, I want you to take out your prayer card as well. And I want you to write down 
uh, one person at least and one place that God has laid on your heart that you want to see people find and follow Jesus. Right? This you're going to hold on to. You're going to keep that. But as we come up and we drop off our offerings, we've got some boards up front and I want you to write down the name. And maybe you don't write down the whole name. It's a small town. If you want to write down first name and initial or just initials or something like that. But we're going to keep bringing these boards out throughout the next two years and we're going to spend time in the morning stopping and praying for our friends and for places that they would be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So I want you to uh, bow with me in prayer and then we'll take a few moments quietly before the Lord to fill these out. Father, I pray that you would be honored and glorified with all of our offerings, whether they are, are small, like the widow's mite, the, the two cents she gave, that we're a sacrifice and that in your economy, we're so much larger even than what the wealthy people put in. I pray, Father, that no matter what the amount, that we would give freely, joyfully, generously from our heart. I pray that we would realize that our giving is for people. It's so that people who are walking in darkness can move into light, who are in death can move into life and wholeness and fullness. Father, thank you for the privilege of participating with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's take a few moments quietly. If you need to talk to your spouse, fill that out. Simon's going to play, and then uh, Don Breland will come up and give us a couple more uh, instructions.